All right, folks, good evening. Good evening. It's nice to be back in class after about a month. Uh, can I see how many of you are strategists here? Uh, who have been to strategy before? Who knows this classroom inside out? Who knows our bathrooms inside out? <laughs> can I see how many of you are hardcore strategists? All right. Okay, so it's nice to see all of you here. A warm welcome to all the new faces. And uh, you made the, the correct choice. Uh, today, I think we are going to talk to you on a few topics. I am really excited <clears throat> about the topic that I'm going to talk to you about in the next 45 minutes or so. I'm not going to take too long, right? My topic today is managing time, so I can't take too long. <laughs> <laughs> that is a hint to, to Yasas, by the way. <laughs> uh, so I just thought I'd start off with a clip. Uh, it's a little late in the evening, uh, short clip. Don't ever do this at home, and then we'll get into the topic. Okay, nothing related to the topic, <laughs> just to get things started. Okay, so my name is Louis, and I'm no stranger to, to you. Uh, I have a couple of slides that I'm going to uh, use, uh, and a few things I want you to take back in the next half an hour to 45 minutes. Just a few things, right? I'll be happy if uh, you just take one thing back. And today I've uh, been requested to talk about this topic, the secret of doing more uh, in less time, right? And uh, when I actually sat and thought about this topic in terms of what I need to share with you, I was actually thinking about my past, uh, my humble beginnings. And I just want to see a raise of hands. How many of you are, how many of you are under 20, 20 years? The, gold, the golden ages right now. Under 20 years, can I see a raise of hands? Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Can you please stand for a minute? Okay, very quickly. We've got a gift for you. Very quickly. Can I ask the under 20s to stand? Under 20s? Come on. Right? We want to see you. My gosh. Under 20s. There are a lot on. Can we give them a round of applause? Huh? Okay, you can sit down now. Under 20s. Quite a bit of you, right? And you made the correct choice. Actually, I started my CIM when I was 16 and a half. 16 and a half. Just before I got my O-level results also. Don't ask me how I do it, how I did it. But I, I started CIM at a very young age. And uh, I think you've, you have an advantage over the others. It's a brilliant decision that you have made to embrace the world's largest growing profession, marketing, right? And then I know some of you are look, giving, me, giving me funny looks saying, hey, Louis, now we are over 20. <laughs> Why do you have to tell us about the over 20s? So can I see how many of you are between 20 to 30? Can I see a raise of hands? You don't need to stand up. <laughs> 20 to 30. OK? So I think a good majority of you are in the prime age of your life. The prime age of your life. I'm sure Yasas would have spoken about uh, fitness and endurance. If he, if he didn't, he always talks about that in class, right? He's probably the fittest man at strategy at the moment. I'm trying to beat him, but I can't, <laughs> uh, right? 
why do I why do I say this? I mean, I I have just passed your vintage, by the way, yeah? just passed your vintage, early 30s. So I can qualify to talk a little bit about the 20s and maybe even the 30s. So I want to draw some parallels. I believe those of you who are under 20 years enjoy life, right? Because you probably are just starting working. You probably are enjoying maybe doing marketing or any other studies you're doing right now. But that is the rebellious age. So the decade, I can draw parallels from my life. The decade from 10 years to 20 years is the most rebellious you've been for the lifetime that you live. Trust me. So those of you who stood up between 10 to 20, you are in something called the rebellious age. Right? You will listen to no one. You will do what you want. I had uh, my wife's cousin who came home at some 2 o'clock in the morning yesterday. That's what they do. Right? And enjoy life. And then you start hitting uh, 20 plus. A good majority of you are in that age. This age is not the rebellious age. Now I'm sure you're trying to cling on to every single word. I'm trying to say, what age is this? This is not the rebellious age. My classification, this is the decade of endurance. This is the decade that you are going to put in the most amount of work for the rest of your life. At least for me, I've had uh, a very uh, not so pleasant childhood. I come from very humble beginnings. So up to 10 years, struggled a lot. Uh, 10 to 20 years, did not study, but made a good choice, started marketing, started CIM. 20 to 30, I'll tell you, whilst my colleagues were doing a lot of other things, I started really doing a lot out there in the companies that I used to work, in terms of knowledge, and 20 to 30. So those of you who are 29, don't worry. Uh, you're probably thinking, I have one year to go, right? But this is the decade, 20 to 30 is the decade that you have to put the most amount of effort that you put in your life. Trust me when I say that. And when you hit 30, it's not downhill. And the next decade from 30 to 40, according to me, is the decade that you enjoy the fruits of all your labor that you put between the last decade. And trust me when I say this, you will reach senior management positions in companies, you will uh, get your qualifications behind your name, you will get married maybe once, twice, thrice, if <laughs> God knows, right? But that decade is going to be the decade where you sit and enjoy the benefits. But I'll tell you, you will not sit and enjoy the benefits of that decade if you don't put the required effort between 20 to 30. So I just thought I'll share that message with you and start my presentation today, doing more in less time. I remember when I was, uh, when I was 20 years, right, um, I had three jobs, a full-time job, a part-time, full-time job, and a part-time job. When I say part-time, full-time job, I mean I was working from six to nine in the night, and then I was doing something during the weekends as well, which is this, talking to students. I started teaching at the age of 20, and it's been a tough decade for me. I have been teaching even as you watched all those cricket matches, even as you went on your trips and did everything, I invested my time on one thing. And no regrets. I put those seeds, planted those seeds. Today I can sit and relax a little bit, enjoy the fruits, See you pass subject after subject. See you win world prize after world prize. Sit and put pen to paper when I have time. Write an article, write a book. And that's what I do right now. But I'll tell you, three jobs, four girlfriends at the same time. <laughs> right, exam after exam. 
And by the way, we didn't have assignments. Good old days, we had to do all 12 subjects for assignments, right? And I remember doing four subjects at the, at the same time. So I can tell you, managing three jobs, few girlfriends, trying the peer pressure that hits you, your friends going out, right? Trying to teach from another side, trying to learn from another side. Uh, little bit of best practices I can share with you on this subject. Doing more in less time. And uh, one of the things that keeps me going um, every single day, even last night I actually worked until 1 o'clock uh, because I heard that there was a small uh, mismatch in one of the chapters in the book I'm going to launch in a few weeks' time. Uh, and the printer called me up and said, uh, we need another few pages. Uh, you need to help us out. And I got the news at about 8 o'clock, started working at 9 o'clock, finished at about 12.31. And I was really tired yesterday, very, very tired. But you know, something that really motivated me when I'm down and out is uh, one of the pictures that I got from one of my staff members. Uh, it was a prank some time ago. And this was the prank. You might not, you might say, hey, Louis, this is not funny, right? Uh, Jing is probably wondering what the hell this is. Huh? Jing is not from here, right? So this is my death notice, by the way. And this was given to me at the, in my early 20s by some of my staff uh, who went and put my death notice here and there, right, to scare a few people. It was a prank to have some fun. But I actually clung on to this death notice. And I started picturing my death notice. I kid you not. I've, uh, this is not the exact notice. It was done very well. I can't find that notice. right? So don't try and read these contents. But every time I think I can't do something, every time I feel that there's no time to do something, Every time I feel that someone tells me, and most of the time that happens when someone tells you, you can't do it, I go back and look at my, picture myself in my death certificate. And if you have not noticed, I've put 2014 there. I've put 2014 there. Well, this is how I live. I live on the edge. And I live life as if it is my, the last year that I have to live. And when I have that at the back of my mind, you wouldn't believe the amount of inspiration that I draw from the fact that I know that I'm going to die very soon. God knows when I'm going to die. I have never checked it out. But I'll tell you, you and I are going to die. We don't know. We don't know when, we don't know, I, God forbid, I, I don't want to live until I'm 100. But what keeps me going, what gives me the inner strength, more than any physical strength, what gives me the inner strength is the fact that I know that I'm going to die and I have limited time. And if you know that, then you would then sit and think of, what am I going to do in the limited time I have? What is the ding I will put in the universe? What is the legacy I will leave behind? What is my purpose? Why am I here? How do I give meaning to time? Don't give meaning to time like a former president of Sri Lanka uh, satellite, uh, huh? Chandrika Bandarnayaka, right? She had a new definition of time. I hope you can remember. All her meetings were, she'll come two hours late. And if you don't recall, our 50th Independence Day, Prince Charles standing there in the hot sun like a marshmallow. <laughs> President Chandrika comes two hours late for the Independence Day celebration. 50th Independence Day celebration. Right. 
So in terms of giving meaning to time, if you ask me, something that really, really keeps me motivated. I have no, I have no complicated theory to give you, but I can tell you, sometimes when I think I need to do something and then when I set a deadline, I will make sure that I remind myself that I'm going to die. What is the average lifespan in Sri Lanka for a male? 63, 66 if you're a female. Right? Now we know why they live longer than us. <laughs> right? And I'll tell you, I'm, I'm 33 now. Looking at the numbers, I have another 33 years, if you average it out, to live. What am I going to do in these 33 years? Am I just going to uh, just be a number in our organization? Am I just going to be a, a number as a citizen of this country? And something that really motivates me was to draw inspiration. Someone who shared similar thoughts is the late Steve Jobs. This is what he had to say. He said, being the richest man in the cemetery doesn't matter to me. Going to bed at night, saying we've done something wonderful, that's what matters to me. I jump out of bed in, mor in the morning. Today when I, when, I, when I get up, I jump out of bed in the morning. As opposed to five years ago, scratch my head, why the hell do I have to go to work? What am I supposed to do? But now, Sri Lanka is emerging, there's such a lot of opportunity. To me, I have come to a point where I won't trade time with anything else. And time is a currency. I have come to a point where if I put my time into something, I will make sure that I will give it my heart and soul and ensure that it will give me a comparative advantage. So, here's a a great quotation from a great man. How long did Steve live for? How long did Steve live for? 50, what, 55, 55, 53? And you know the passion he had. You know the kind of drive he had. And for him, he knew for over a decade that he was going to die. He knew that he had cancer. I don't know I have cancer. But this guy knew that he had cancer and he, his days were numbered. But I can tell you, if all of us start thinking we are supposed to and, 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 and do what we are supposed to do, knowing that one day we are going to die, you will do things faster than it will motivate you to do things faster and better. Because when you look around, I, I see a lot of people who behave as if they behave that they are going to be on this world for about 2,000, 3,000 years. I can't understand the kind of time they are wasting. When I look at your generation, when I look at you sometimes, the kind of time you waste doing all non-value-adding things, I can't fathom if I had that time or if I can turn the clock somehow, get into the time machine, go back in time. I took two years. To finish my CIM, I will try and finish it in one year. I can't go back. We can't get this great human being back as well. So I'd like to leave a message with you. If you want to get the best out of time, yes, I'll give you some tips. Organize yourself. I'll give you a few tips that I use, right? But to me, the greatest drive that I have of managing time is the fact that I want to do something before I die. I want to put a ding in the universe. That's what this guy said. It can be a small ding, but it is going to be a ding. And here's, a, here's something that I want to talk to you about. But uh, before this, can I ask uh, all of you to stand? We are going to do a small exercise, right? So we are going to check whether you have a left brain and a right brain. Huh? Some of you have been sitting on your brains all this time, <laughs> right? So your left brain and your right brain are supposed to do two things, right? Well, your left brain is the mathematical side, the analytical side. And your right brain is the 
creative side, creative side. If you didn't know that by now, we learned that in year five in school, right? So we're going to check whether you have a left brain and a right brain. So I want you to do this. I want all of you in the class to connect with each other. Can you keep your hands like this, right? And your other hand like this and connect with someone, connect with someone, someone else. And I want the whole class to connect, whole class to connect. We're going to check whether you have the left brain and the right brain. Everyone must connect. Right? Atta hodane gutne samaru ada. Ah. Right. Now don't grab the hand. You are only supposed to do this. Right? Okay. Okay. So when I say acha. Listen to me very carefully. When I say acha, I want your left brain to give you a signal and I want you to grab the other person's finger. Can you do that? When I say acha, I want you to grab the other person's finger. Very simple. But also remember, at the same time, your right brain has to pull the other finger out. Because someone else is going to grab your finger. Are you with me? Are you with me? Right? My gosh, there are cocktail of fingers there. Huh? Okay, are you with me? Right, let's do this. Right? One, two, three. <laughs> well, no, 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 no. I didn't say Acha. I didn't say Acha. So you have no brain. Huh? Okay, now let's do it again. Let's do it again. Listen to me very, very carefully. Left brain and right brain. Okay? One, two. I enjoy the look on your face. <laughs> <laughs> you look so stupid, seriously. <laughs> Three, four, five. Ah! Okay, okay, let's sit down, let's sit down, let's sit down, let's sit down. Let's sit down. <laughs> Okay, what's a legacy? What's a legacy? What's a legacy? Any answers? No t-shirts? What's a legacy? Huh? Something you leave behind. Something you leave behind? Something that you could have inherited. Any other thoughts at the back? Balcony? What's a legacy? Something memorable, something that has changed. Okay, lovely. Something that? Unique, okay. Revolutionary, huh? Some contributions. Any other thoughts? All the girls are talking today. Huh? Any other thoughts? What is a legacy? What you've said, what you've given me right now is a typical Oxford textbook definition of what a legacy is. But I like the choice of words that you, you use to articulate this thought. But to me, I have a different definition of what a legacy is. A legacy to me is not when you find a wife. My wife is not in the room. <laughs> right? A legacy is, to me, is not when you have a firstborn or your kids. Right? A legacy, in, in my words, a true legacy that you leave behind, is when someone would remember you a hundred years from now. Now think about this profound definition of what a legacy is. Okay? If someone remembers you a hundred years from now, no Oxford would give you this definition. Right? It is not a Wikipedia definition, it is Louis' definition. This is my definition of a legacy. The legacy that I would like to leave behind will be a legacy that someone would one day say, there was a guy who lived 100 years ago, he's Louis, and he, he achieved this, he did this, he said this. He invented this, he wrote this song, he wrote this book, he was a brilliant actor. <laughs> right? And if I get someone 100 years from now, you know something? The truth is, 
I can't even remember my grandfather's name. I don't, if I, if I put you to test also, some of you have never seen your grand, grandparents uh, or your great grandparents. If I ask you, uh, what are your great grandparents' name? You will make a complete mockery of it because you will not know their names. Of course, if you have not seen them, uh, you will not know them. So think about this. They give life to your parents or your grandparents, but we don't know our own descendants. We have, some of us have never seen them. Some of us don't even know their names, like me. My both grandfathers, I have never seen. I don't even know them. I take about five minutes to recall their names. I'm serious. Because they are great old names, you know. Now you might say, Louis, that's a, that's a shame. But the truth is this. The truth is, to me, the way in which I look at what a defi the definition of a legacy is to give something back to society. In a way, that 100, maybe 200, maybe 500 years from now, how can you leave your name and your work behind? So that they would recall. Do you know Anzoff's Matrix? Have you heard of the Anzoff's Matrix? Anzoff's, Anzoff's. Those of you who have not heard of the Anzoff's Matrix, Iger Anzoff invented the Anzoff's Matrix 75 years ago. It's the only matrix he did developed. Unlike Porter, he didn't sit and develop uh, 10 other matrix, right? Value chain, no, just one. And today we, we use the Anzos matrix in class and we say, uh, Anzos matrix, Anzos matrix. We don't know if the Anzos is a person. And I'm sure 500 years from now, still people will say Anzos matrix. And to me, there are only a few ways that you can leave a legacy behind, as per my definition. If you want people to recall you 100 years from now, one of which is music, one of which, another, can be politics, bloody in our country. The other is to invent things, become a scientist, right? You can be an author, you can be a musician. And something that you would give back to society so that people will remember you a hundred years from now. <coughs> so if someone hereafter asks you the definition of what a legacy is, to me, that is my definition of a legacy. Now, think about your golden years. This 10 years, 20 to 30. How can you put the foundation, how can you put a 10 year foundation and build a legacy that you leave behind, not only for your kids, but for a lot of people to think about in the next 100 years. Right? Uh, I showed you a picture of uh, Steve Jobs before. This guy, will probably talk about him for the next 1,000 years, maybe even more. Can you imagine? He's dead and gone, but we will talk about Yes, this is Steve Jobs, by the way. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure we will talk about him like we talk about Aristotle and we talk about all the great, uh, you know, guys who lived, uh, you know, hundreds and thousands of years ago, right? We will talk about this guy one day and say, well, there was this guy when my great grandfather lived in the world called Steve Jobs. To me, he has left a legacy behind. We can't all be Steve Jobs, but in what we do, in what we invent, in what we create, it can be a song that you, that you do out of passion. Uh, I'm doing something passionate uh, these few days, uh, spending a little bit of time doing this. Uh, this is actually uh, the final print that I've got. Uh, it's the first of its kind in the market. Uh, it's called Strategic Marketing. Uh, which is all the management principles explained in the context of Sri Lanka. There's a nice national flag on it, right? I got that idea from uh, uh, Deshamani Ranjit Page, who's the owner of Kagels. Uh, and I can tell you, uh, I've been working on this for the past two years. For the past two years, I have put a lot of sweat, blood, and tears to develop this book. It's not going to stop me. My next edition, 
is going to come out in February next year. Third edition, if Kotler is alive, right, I've written to him already. Uh, he has not written back. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, who knows? I'm going to keep trying. Those of you who don't know Kotler, he's not my grandfather. <laughs> Kotler is the godfather of marketing, right? My dream is one day to co-author a book with a great like Kotler. It's just the first edition. Who knows? My 14th edition. He might reply my email. Right. I'm going to see him. So a few tips. Um, if you ask me, guys, some of the things that I do uh, to make sure that I make the best out of my time, uh, one of which is to organize yourself thoroughly. Right? Now, when I see, uh, particularly you guys in your generation, uh, you know, something that I always see, particularly looking through your assessments, your assignments, is the fact that your organizing skills are extremely poor. If I'm scared to look at your laptop to see how you organize your files in your laptop, right? I'm scared to come and see your uh, desk, your, your study, where you study. And one day, I'll probably dread coming, walking into your office and looking at the table that you work in. And if you ask me, one of the things that I do that really, really help me manage my time is to be extremely, ex annoyingly organized. Uh, my wife is seated at the back. Uh, you can ask her. 99% uh, of the time, uh, we fight over my annoying habit of everything being organized. <laughs> right? And today, I can tell you, uh, I'm very happy. Uh, everything is organized in the home front. Everything is organized in the office. My desk, my outray is cleared before I go. My emails, I have two emails, it's all done. I delete all my emails as well. I maintain a list. I cut everything before I sleep in the night. I have to finish stuff. I'll delegate a few to my wife. So she says the success of me managing my time is her. Yes, sometimes you need to delegate. But if I ask you, how many of us are genuinely managing all these things, these time wasters? You know, I know there's a lot of fun activity. You can't be a, a nerd. You have to get out there and do a lot of things at this age. But I can tell you, if you really analyze, if I sit and analyze your time that you spend and, and what you do, and I can tell you, a good 50% of the time you do things that doesn't correspond to the legacy that you want to leave behind. You do things that has no correlation to the purpose of life. And something that I have learned to do always, and I question, is if someone asks me to come and maybe even speak somewhere, I just refused uh, someone who just walked into the office and said, hey, he'll pay me 100,000 bucks to come and talk to his sales team. I said, a lot of money for me, 100,000 bucks, a lot of money. Isn't that a lot of money? It's a lot of money, right? It's double the size of my salary. But I told the guy, my priority right now is my book launch. I'm extremely focused on that. And I'm not going to accommodate any clutter that comes my way. You can tempt me with even a million bucks. I'm not going to do it, right? And I can tell you, when I, when I look at the meetings that I handle, uh, some of you are working. You go from meeting to meeting to meeting to meeting. Your productivity at the end of the day is virtually next to nothing. And what we need to do sometimes is to eradicate these time wasters, to get rid of these. And you get carried away. And I'll tell you, most of the time, sometimes I also get carried away. There's a lot of non-value-adding activities. I've turned around and told my boss, 
Right? I work for a female, female boss. Very difficult to manage. <laughs> right? But she loves me to bits. Every week I go and sit down with her. I said, give me 15 minutes of your time. I need to prioritize my week. Please don't send me email after email after email. I will complete whatever that you have given me to do within the week. And my boss and I have now have perfect understanding for the past uh, year and a half now. Now she doesn't even bother if I come to work or not. Of course, I go to work, <laughs> right? And I do the things I'm supposed to do. But it's up to us to organize other people around us. How many of you organize your parents? How many of you organize your boyfriend or your girlfriend? How many of you have would dare to organize your boss? To do that, you have to be extremely organized. Extremely organized. So that you prioritize and schedule and understand all the time-wasting activities and get it out of the way. I call these non-value adding activities. Activities that won't give you any competitive advantage. It won't differentiate you. It will never result in a legacy that you will leave behind. So another simple point that I'd like to give you is to watch out for these. And here's a few things that you can do. Analyze how you're spending your time. Organize. Prioritize systematize, and I like the last one. You know, I've been giving uh, my mom some advice on the last point. Uh, I opened a Skype account for my mother about two years ago. Can you believe that? Uh, that generation, they are so IT illiterate. Uh, she has been calling all her friends, running big bills. One day when I saw her, saw her paying one of those bills, I said, well, what are you doing? And then I said, get on Skype. I opened a Skype account. Uh, first few days, uh, she didn't know what to do. But after that, she got hooked onto Skype. Right now, she has a fast ADSL line, uh, saved a lot of money from, for her. Right? And after that, uh, she saw me using Facebook one day. So she asked me what the hell Facebook was. So I put a picture, and I registered her name and opened a Facebook account for her. And I can tell you, that's the biggest mistake I've ever made. <laughs> Because I got married six months ago. One year ago, she comes onto my Facebook wall and she types, son, now you need to settle down and get married. <laughs> and I was overseas at that time. I, I saw I came to my Facebook page after two days. And I had 1,200 friends at that time. I had everyone tagging songs, you know. <laughs> so I had to. I, I couldn't close her account. I had to go back and tell her that a Facebook wall is not like any other wall. <laughs> right? And here's something else that we ought to do. And this is something that, that, that I think very carefully. You know, sometimes in life, we do things. We make decisions. We run meetings. Uh, and we try to do so many things. You know, we have like a machine gun approach to everything. We like to you know, keep shooting in all directions. If you ask me what my priorities are for this month, I will be able to tell you right now. If you ask me what my goals are for this year, they are crystal clear. And I have nothing to hide. I can even share them with you. I have some mind-related goals, knowledge-related goals. I have some heart-related goals, relationship-related goals. I have some body-related goals, physical goals, and I have some spirit-related goals, spiritual goals. If you ask me, I have 16 goals that I've set myself for myself this year. Do you know what you're supposed to achieve this year? Yes, me knows. And everything I do, every single accommodation, every single intrusion, someone will come and Take my time. They'll take one hour, two hours. Every single thing I do, I think of the 16 things that I need to do this year. The five things I need to do this month. To have perfect clarity. And if you like, how can we learn to be 
snipers with the projects that we handle, with the things that we do, as opposed to shooting all over the place. I'll skip through some, some slides. Here's a slide that I, I like. Uh, here's another, another skill that you need to develop. How can you have the passion and the mental energy, the mental energy, to clearly focus on what you're doing? Now, some of you have made a choice to start studying. Some of you have made a choice uh, to achieve certain other goals. But how can you have clear focus, razor sharp focus? If you ask me, I will not listen to anyone when I'm focused on getting something done. If I'm really focused on getting something done, I will make sure that no one will distract me. Not even my boss, not even my wife. No one will distract me. I will seclude myself. You will, you will see me working day in and day out, having Red Bull after Red Bull. Some of you have that, no, towards assignments. <laughs> Extreme focus. And I'd like to talk to you a little bit about this word. Because I see it a lot lacking in your generation, right? Uh, anyone who can recall who this is? Who, who is this? Who is this guy? Huh? Yeah? Yes? This guy is Mofara. Mofara. He's a 10,000 meters. Olympic athlete. You know that this guy, uh, the Olympics were held last year, right, in London? Four years before that, or five years before that, whenever the Olympics are held, this guy ran the 10,000 uh, kilometer marathon, 10,000 meter marathon, right? And he came last. Can you believe that? You come to an Olympic event and you come last. And he tried his best. Four years after that, he comes back and he wins the gold medal at the London Olympics. And he just won an award, I saw last week, just won an award for Father of the Year in the UK. Father of the Year in the UK. Extremely humble guy, Mo Farah. Uh, you know, uh, I'd like to have a little bit of the passion that he has. A little bit of the focus that he has. Can you believe that? You come last and four years later, can you imagine the kind of training that he would have put in that four years to outsmart everyone who would have also been training for that four years? And he's an amazing case study. Uh, I like this picture. Please don't do this. Uh, but to me, this, this explains this word to me. as a cute picture, but a very bad gesture. <laughs> he probably doesn't understand what it is, <laughs> right? Uh, to me, it explains this word beautifully, right? Can someone tell me, what is passion? Can you give me some definitions? Love. Love, OK, <laughs> lovely. Huh? Drive. Drive. What is passion? What is passion? How many of you think you, you are passionate? Can I see a raise of hands? Passionate. You are passionate. Are you sure? Oh, yeah. yeah? Yes. So what is passion? If you are passionate, what is passion? It's a dying urge to achieve. It's a dying urge to achieve? Gives up. Huh? Gives up. Gives up. OK. Any other thoughts? What is passion? All the, uh, sorry? Enthusiasm. Enthusiasm, yes. Any other thoughts? I love this word. You see, I, I, am a, I am a very emotional guy. I'm a very passionate guy. Uh, even if I dig a hole, I'll do it with passion. <laughs> Can you see the passion this guy has? 
He, he doesn't know what he's doing. Look at his face. I like the thought that you articulated. You see, there's a nice story that talks about passion. A son walks up to his father and says, Dad, what is passion? Is it a drink? The father says, go and bring a bowl of water. So the son brings a bowl of water. So the, the father asks him to put his head inside. And he holds the son's head. And he keeps it for about three seconds and takes it out. And the son asks, what are you doing? I almost lost my breath. Then he puts him again inside the water. Keeps it for four seconds. And the father knows when, to, when his son can't breathe. Right? So he, he takes it out. Five seconds. This fellow is wondering, what the hell are you doing, dad? Puts him again inside water. <laughs> Seven seconds. He gets up, gasping for his, his breath. And he has a similar look on his face. And I like the definition you gave. If you are passionate, if I am passionate, we will be like we are living for our last breath. We will be like that kid who was fighting to somehow fight his father and stay alive. I like his definition that he used. To stay alive. We think we're passionate, but in our jobs, in what we do, are we doing it with that kind of passion? Can other people see that passion in us? Or are we passionate like, are we passionate like that? Can other people see that passion? You know, it is like a, it is like a disease. If you are passionate, other people around you will also be passionate. They will see it in you. And I think one of the biggest things that, that, that you need to do more, if you are to do more in less time, is to, is to be extremely passionate. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter putting this poster on this wall. It doesn't matter whether you're changing this bulb. Do it with passion. Do it with that vigor. Do it with that energy. And you'll realize that you will get more done. Here's a nice uh, quote that sums it all up. Uh, I like this quote. You know, when, the, when, when it rains, all the birds occupy shelter, right? But this guy, he goes and does something different. The only bird that does something different. The eagle avoids all the rain by flying above the clouds. The problem is common to all, but the attitude of the eagle made the difference. Um, one last thing I'd like to share with you uh, is to also, even as we go about this world, uh, trying to get things done, be human. Here's the most famous man, the most powerful man in the world, being human. It is okay to be human. It is okay to make mistakes. Don't, don't do a Bill Clinton. <laughs> right? But sometimes it is important for us to, to be human as well. And I'd like to close with a few stories. Um, Richard Branson, uh, you know, who's Richard Branson? Richard Branson's a virgin? <laughs> Who is, right? Yes, Richard Branson, yes, you know him, right? A crazy guy, right? Recently wore, wore a skirt and got into the Air Asia plane, right? Things he would do for publicity. But he, he did something very interesting. You know, I like the Branson theory on managing risk. Uh, this guy owns about 200 Virgin companies, right? 200 plus companies, you name it, Virgin Cola, Virgin Atlantic, Virgin Blue, Virgin right, Music, Virgin Virgin everything except for Virgin Brides. <laughs> Actually, he has a company called Virgin Brides as well. I'm serious, which is a, 
which is a company that, well, I'm serious, I'm not kidding. Go and check that out, right? This guy, he does something very interesting. Uh, so he hosts a show on Virgin Radio, and he takes a Harvard qualified uh, graduate, and he says, I'm gonna ask you a question on risk. This guy thrives on risk. The kind of risk he takes, no one else takes. There's a case study where he is, he's the first person in the world uh, who have bought a Boeing jet on his American Express card. <laughs> I, I kid you not. His, and we use it in the American Express world. He has bought a Boeing jet on the credit card. And if you read his book, Screw It, Let's Do It, or Losing My Virginity, he says, one day he made the decision to buy an island on the plane when he saw the island. I want that island. <laughs> what am I trying to tell you? This guy thrives on risk. But you know his principle on risk? I love this principle. He was hosting a radio show one day on Virgin Radio, and he, uh, live on air, he was interviewing a qualified Harvard graduate. And he asked the graduate, I'm going to ask you two questions. And if you get the right answer, I will let you be the CEO of one of my Virgin companies for three months. Right? So he said, uh, I'm going to give you some money right now. Right? So let's e equal it to Sri Lankan rupees. Right? My friend, if I give you 50,000 rupees right now, I'm going to give it to you right now. 50,000. 50,000 for Richard is nothing. Right? Versus, I am going to flip a coin. Huh? Head or tails. Nona Pola, right? And if you are lucky and you get the right answer, I will give you 25 times more than 50,000. So if you pick heads, and if you get heads, I'm going to give you. Now, can you imagine live on air, everyone listening, he says, simple risk question. I'm going to give you 50,000 now, or I'm going to flip a coin, head or tails. If you get it right, you get. 25 times more than 50,000. If you get it wrong, you won't even get that 50,000. So he asks this question. And he, he gives the graduate the chance to, to respond. So let me ask you, what will you do? Will you, is it option A, 50,000? How many of you will take the 50,000? Can I see a raise of hands? You'll take the 50,000. Okay. How many of you will go for the big one? Can I see a raise of hands? Right? OK? Right. So the choice, OK, if you ask me, uh, and, and if you read the book, you'll realize the graduate also says the same thing. The graduate says, I will take the 50,000. I won't take, I won't go for the majority decision. I won't take 25 times more. Now, you are probably wondering why. Only this guy raised his hand, because he's heard this story before, right? Yeah, actually. No? In front of my face. It is? Absolutely. Right. He says, I will go with option one. I will take the 50,000. And Richard says, that is the exact answer. Not only will I give you the 50,000, I will still give you for picking the right answer. I will give you three months to manage my empire. Why did he say that? Never leave your hard work or whatever you do hanging on luck. This guy takes all the risks. He buys planes on his credit card. He buys islands from his private jet. That's the kind of life he's living. But he says, there's one kind of risk that I will never take. Risks that I can't influence, risks that I cannot control, risks that I will leave to luck, I am not going to take them. So the message I'd like to leave you is with that. So in summary, be passionate, be extremely organized, right? Don't ever Skype chat with your people at home, right? Make sure you put passion into everything that you do and take control of things, right? So thank you very much. Hi, my name is Shashi, 
uh, and I'm a student at Strategy, and I'm really proud to say that I'm a student here. I work for a leading telco in Sri Lanka, and I'm here to get myself qualified on CIM because I believe that it is the qualification for me, and Strategy is the best place for me to get this qualification. Today's program was named the Skills Talad, uh, which was conducted by Yasas Hevage and Mr. Louis Dias, who are actually good role models for anybody who would like to uh, move forward in life. There are Richard Bransons out there, and there are uh, people like Steve. There were people like Steve Jobs, but we don't have many local examples for us to look up to and to uh, learn the lessons. We all come from different walks of life, and we all have a, so uh, a story to tell. And we have our set goals, and we need to get there. And we need support. We can't do it alone. And these two gentlemen and the strategy team, they give us the guidance and the uh, equipment to move forward.